Um, and I, I, I wonder if any of you know who said this. Um, maybe just type in the chat and take a guess at um, who might have quoted that um, or who might have provided that quote. Don't be shy. No idea, that's fine. Uh, could have been anyone. Um, I'm going to type in the chat Bill Gates. Um, maybe it was Elon Musk. Um, maybe it was Bill Gates. I'll give you guys kind of 10 more seconds to just suggest someone. Alan Turing, that's a very good guess. All right, so um, it could have been Bill Gates, it could have been Alan Turing, it could have been Elon Musk, but in reality, that quote came from an AI. So there's this really cool tool created by OpenAI, um, and it's like basically a neural network that completes text, and somebody created a talk to transform out of it. So I went into the website, and I literally typed in machine learning is, and it generated this text for me. As you can see, machine learning is a field that is basically da 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 da. So what you just read was generated by an AI. And then you can see it continues. So it says, um, oh, I actually started as a data scientist, and then as a research scientist, and now I'm kind of in the middle again. So it starts rambling on a bit, but all of this text is unique and being generated by the algorithm. To prove that to you, I'm going to go back into the site and type in the exact same prompt, and you'll see something different come up. So this isn't that it's just drag, you know, getting a, a Wikipedia definition and pasting it there. It's actually generating this text, and based on every last word, it is, ent it is created. So as you can see here, I'm going to say machine learning is, and let's see what it completes for me. There you go, a completely different definition, and it's a fairly legible one. I mean, it says things like, it will provide valuable insights, enabling us to improve our services and products. Um, and then something about, it's hard to use because you need to run for all the available calls in the system. I'd avoid it, except for some extreme cases of cancer. See, that doesn't make any sense at all. So as much as it makes kind of grammatical sense, the actual sentence doesn't make much sense. So. It's quite good and it even displays what we could consider maybe a personality, but it's all being generated by this machine. Um, and I think this is going to encapsulate a lot about what we're going to talk about today. Just the essence of machine learning being this thing that, you know, we'll better understand soon, but that can, you know, have all these really cool applications such as text generation, which is also something that's maybe you know, a bit scary because it fooled some of us. I mean, I, the first time I, I came across this thing, I, I read a news article. It was actually written by an AI about AI, and I was, um, yeah, I was quite disturbed at that because uh, I mean, imagine it just generating things that we think are written by the people. Um, so yeah, so let's get back to that question of what is machine learning, and to do that, we need to first talk about what artificial intelligence is. And in our context, we could think of artificial intelligence as computer systems that display intelligence or that have display intelligent behavior. And the question of what is intelligent behavior is something that's up to much debate. Um, but broadly speaking, we often say that intelligence is performing the kind of tasks that maybe humans could perform. So this changes all the time. I mean, there was a stage when, you know, you went into a website and saw it say, hello, Jonathan. People thought, oh, that's pretty cool. That's pretty intelligent. It remembers my name just because when you maybe signed up, you put your name in. And that is, in a way, intelligent behavior. Another form of intelligent behavior is maybe um, Siri, when you say Siri, call mom, and then Siri actually goes and calls your mom. Um, and even though that's as simple as Siri literally hearing you say the word mom, going into your contacts and pressing the call button, um, we think that's pretty intelligent. Same as robots on an assembly line that are doing these kind of complex tasks and building cars or even self-driving cars. Um, those are all examples of artificial intelligence. And what machine learning is, is it's the subset of artificial intelligence where it's algorithm, algorithms that display intelligent behavior, but also improve over time because of methods of statistical learning. And that's the core of it here. These algorithms aren't only intelligent, but they actually learn and improve over time through methods that we'll discuss later. And another thing to mention here is what deep learning is. Now, not all machine learning is kind of these complex, complex models. Some of it can be very simple. So deep learning is when we have machine learning models that kind of combine lots of different layers and models together to kind of solve even more complex tasks. So deep learning is a part of machine learning and machine learning is part of the kind of whole range of artificial intelligence. 
So um, I hope that gave you a good idea of, of what machine learning is, but we'll have watch a video quickly that I think will um, kind of nail the point. Our ability to learn and get better at tasks through experience is part of being human. When we're born, we know almost nothing and can do almost nothing for ourselves. But soon, we're learning and becoming more capable every day. But did you know that computers can do the same? Machine learning brings together statistics and computer science to enable computers to learn how to do a given task without being programmed to do so. Just as your brain uses experience to improve at a task, so can computers. Say you need a computer that can tell the difference between a picture of a dog and a picture of a cat. You could begin by feeding images and telling it, this one's a dog, that one's a cat. A computer program to learn will seek statistical patterns within the data that will enable it to recognise a cat or a dog in the future. It might figure out on its own that cats have shorter noses and that dogs come in a larger variety of sizes and then represent that information numerically, organising it in space. But, crucially, it's the computer, not the programmer, that identifies those patterns and establishes the algorithm by which future data will be sorted. One example of a simple yet highly effective algorithm is to find the optimal line separating cats from dogs. When the computer sees a new picture, it checks which side of the line it falls on and then says either cat or dog. But of course there can be mistakes. The more data the computer receives, the more finely tuned its algorithm becomes and the more accurate it can be in its predictions. Machine learning is already widely applied. It's the technology behind facial recognition, text and speech recognition, spam filters on your inbox, online shopping or viewing recommendations, credit card fraud detection and so much more. At the University of Oxford, machine learning researchers are combining statistics and computer science to build... Cool. So, um... Yeah, I, I'm just going to admit this person that, that seems to be in the waiting room. So I think that video also kind of builds on what I've talked about. And at this stage, I just want to ask if you have any questions, um, if you're still confused about maybe what machine learning is and its distinction to kind of the broader field of AI. So I'll give you guys a few seconds to ask a question if you have any. Otherwise, you can always raise your hand. And Hi guys, that's really strange. For some reason I was kicked from that, but I've rejoined. Um, I know that Zoom is prone to sometimes randomly kicking people and I sincerely hope that it doesn't happen again. I don't think it will. Um, anyway, so back to the chat. Um, did anybody have any questions? I guess I won't see those, those questions now um, because I was kicked, but uh, yeah, um, I'll give you another few seconds to, okay, great, no questions asked. Cool. So. Moving on, um, I've given you kind of a nice explanation of machine learning and why it's different from a lot of other forms of AI. So what I want us to talk about now is, is, is this idea of rules-based versus machine learning. So in rules-based intelligence, the, the kind of algorithm is programmed exactly. So it does exactly what it's told, but it's, as a result, it ends up doing something that we think is intelligent. So Siri might be told if somebody says, is call mom. Siri must look for contacts with the name mom and then call that contact. That's not machine learning, but we would say it's something that's quite intelligent. 
And that's very much rules-based. So um, rules-based is often a lot of if this, do that. And machine learning solves problems where we couldn't at all do what, what would be a rules-based kind of solution. So to illustrate that, I'm just going to quickly go on to this nice online game called Quick Draw. And I'd really recommend that you guys um, play around with it in your own time. It's fascinating and it really, really helps with concept. Um, so let's play this game called Quick Draw, right? And it, it's asking me to draw a foot in under 20 seconds. And I'm not a great drawer. Um, so please bear with me as I try my best to draw a foot. You can laugh at my toes. I see elbow. Oh, I know. It's foot. Immediately it recognizes as a foot, even though it was a pretty terrible drawing. I didn't even have toenails. I'm going to try and draw an oven. I see elbow, or square, or suitcase, or necklace. I see dishwasher, or washing machine. Oh, I know, it's oven. Again, it recognized that as an oven. And you can see it's guessing and constantly kind of getting better guesses as I do it. I see diving board, or bench. I see piano, or van, or anvil. Oh, I know, it's computer. I mean, that didn't look like a computer to me. Okay, I'm gonna try I to see do a dolphin now. Or string bean. Maybe the tail. I see nail. Okay, or uh, airplane. The dolphin is not going very well. Or mosquito. <laughs> nope. Um, I don't actually know how to draw a dolphin. Guys. I see shark. Oh, okay, a shark. What can I do? Maybe a hole. I see trumpet. Nah. Okay, I recognize that as a trumpet. Sorry, I couldn't guess it. Piano should be a bit easier. We just do that. We have a I see a suitcase or keyboard or eraser or sleeping bag. And I maybe... see jail. Get I see fins. But um, maybe we, we make it a bit black somewhere. Oh, I know. It's piano. There we go. Recognizes the piano. I think this is the last one. It's a spoon. Shouldn't be too hard to make. I see circle. Oh, I know. It's spoon. Excellent. So you see how in all six cases, okay, sorry, except for the dolphin, it guessed what I was drawing, even though these things could be drawn in millions of ways. And we can see this in the data, right? So. If I go to the data and maybe click on it for, um, let's see, for ant, okay? So in all these examples of ants, you can see that they're kind of some similar features. They've often got these little kind of balls that represent parts of the body, but all of them have been drawn differently. Some of them seem to have kind of like, you know, little legs, some of them don't, some of them have antennas, some of them look more like caterpillars. They've all been classified and used to build this model, and they've all been classified as ants. Um, and the whole point of this is to show you essentially why we can't use a rules-based approach to this problem. Because imagine we were trying to use rules-based, right? So in a rules-based approach, the designers will manually develop the flow and the logic. They'll say, if this has this to this, if this has this to this. So imagine with maybe an apple, right? You want to say, um, if the object is circular, it could be an apple. If it's circular and has a stem and has like a leaf, then it's an apple. But for example, you know, maybe looking at, at this one here, it doesn't, some of these ones don't have leaves, but they're still distinctly apples. Some of them aren't circular because maybe they've had a bite taken out of them, but they're still apples. So very quickly, a rules-based approach wouldn't be able to account for all the millions of ways we could draw an apple. Whereas as we've just seen, machine learning can. So in quick draw, it would take a bunch of things that people have said are carrots and it would find the kind of essential features of a carrot. And now I could give it a completely different image to those 10 it's trained off of, but it will still classify them as a carrot. And that's kind of the essential idea behind machine learning where we're training a model using examples rather than explicitly saying all of these things, you know, lead to this. So now that I've given you an example, uh, an idea of kind of rules based versus, um, versus machine learning. I want you guys to answer some questions for me. So I'm going to give you a problem and you must tell me which one would be better for the solution, a rules-based or machine learning approach. So if the problem was taking a list of song titles and kind of arranging them in alphabetical order, which approach do you think would be better? Please type in the chat, rules or machine learning. All right. So three people, four people, five people. Okay, so everyone's saying rules-based. And this is in fact correct, because we can quite easily, you know, just with a set of rules, um, arrange things in alphabetical order. We just say, look at the first letter. If it's A, place it before all things that start with the letter B, and so on. 
Um, and there are obviously smarter ways and better algorithms to do this, but essentially we can do it with just a set of rules. We don't need machine learning for this problem. The next problem is ranking web search results. So, you know, I Google um, Spain and a bunch of results come up. Um, what do you think would be the best solution for this? Would we use maybe a rules-based approach or a machine learning approach? Okay, so somebody said ML, somebody said rules-based, another person said rules-based. Somebody said ML, so it's kind of split here. So far we've got two for each. Okay, more people saying machine learning now, but somebody said that rules basically well. And actually, the solution here is that both of them can be used. And what you often find is with ranking search results, there's a combination of them. Because you do have to follow some rules. For example, you might want to rank based on popularity. So the site that have been visited the most. Then, you know, you don't need a machine learning algorithm for that. You can just say, okay, find the site with the most likes or the most views, put that at the top. Second most, put it second top. But also, you know, with all the personalization we're seeing these days, you also want to go a bit deeper than that. You want to maybe learn the preferences of the person making that search and then also tailor it. So two people might search Spain and somebody might get, um, you know, surfing spots in Spain because they've been identified as a surfer. Somebody might get great restaurants in Spain because they've, they've been identified as a um, person who likes different types of cuisine. So as much as you can do it rules-based, you can make it even kind of more personalized and, and better with the combination of that and machine learning. The next thing is predicting housing prices based on location. Please type again, rules-based or machine learning. Okay, so we've got somebody who said machine learning. Great. So most people have said machine learning here. <laughs> I seem to have been kicked again, but that's fine. I got back in very quickly this time. Um, actually, I think I'm going to just refresh the page. Okay, my, my, my good friends, I've realized what the issue is. The issue is that I keep on checking the participants. Obviously, I'm anxious to have lots of people watching this and it refreshes the page. I'm just going to stop doing that. But yeah, so for the last one, a lot of people said machine learning. And the answer is, in fact, machine learning. And the reason is that it would be very hard to be able to understand all the factors that go into a housing price for every single part of the world. Um, for example, the kind of factors that lead to housing prices in Cape Town or different parts of Cape Town might be very different to California or London. Um, so the best way would be to learn through examples, to kind of get lots of examples of houses in Cape Town and their prices, and then based off of that, then to um, you know predict those. I think we've got one example left of this kind of rules-based versus machine learning, or maybe two more. So the next one is processing online payments. What do you think, rules-based or machine learning? Nice, Zach and Carlson say rules, rules. Okay, so four people have already said rules and that is in fact the answer because you know, processing online payments is a predictable task. Every single time it's essentially the same. Um, you, you, know, you kind of say, okay, this is the amount that they need to pay. You link to maybe the kind of payment system. You say, you send a request saying, subtract this amount from their account, put into our account. Um, no learning needs to be done here, but there are applications of machine learning, such as fraud detection. Um, okay, so we do have one more. Um, and this one, the answer should be fairly obvious to everyone, but um, what's the best approach for classifying an object in a photo?
Great. Okay. Literally everybody has said ML. I'm happy to hear that because it means that we were paying attention. Um, and just like we saw in quick draw, the best solution is indeed um, machine learning because there are so many kind of factors that can go into a photo. And if you're trying to let's say classify cats and dogs, there's so many different types of cats or ways that a cat can be photographed that it'll just take millions of years to be able to kind of work out all the different options for cats, whereas machine learning can do that quite easily. So that's that. So the recap is that rules-based works when we have defined rules and the improvements just come from kind of better algorithms. So in alphabetizing like a list of songs, you can do a very kind of clunky approach like mine, or you can do all sorts of different sorting algorithms. But machine learning comes from when we need to actually learn patterns from the data. And then in this case, the improvements come from giving it more and more training data. So when we play QuickDraw, we're actually helping train the algorithm. So when the people that first started playing QuickDraw played it, they probably would draw the foot that I drew, but not get it classified as a foot because it was still quite a premature algorithm. But now at the stage where I can draw something really, really bad, and um, yeah, it classifies it as a foot. And just to respond to a comment on the chat, yes, we are indeed learning. Um, I'm glad that you all said that because, um, yeah, that's the thing. Machine learning is modeled off of how we learn. We learn by examples. And I'm hoping that all the examples I gave you have now kind of forever in your mind cemented the difference between rules-based and machine learning. And Google has all sorts of different, you know, types of machine learning or all, all sorts of applications of it in its, across its products. So like just in Google search, so the ranking, like I said, is a combination of rules-based and machine learning. Um, when you're typing your emails and you're getting kind of, you know, automated responses or it's filling in your text. That's an example of machine learning. Um, anything to do with Google Translate, just being able to translate graphics like handwriting or text or speech to other languages or being able to search by photos. Those are all some really good examples of machine learning. So the next section is going to be what can machine learning do? And here I'm going to look at the different techniques for different problems now that we're focusing on machine learning. But before that, I just want to check, does anybody have a question? Alrighty, I don't see any questions, so I'm gonna move on. Um, so what can machine learning do? So one of the kind of most obvious things we've talked about is classification. Um, and this is when we basically want to get an input, maybe it's an image, maybe it's a person's profile or their, their details and make some form of prediction or class, I mean, some form of classification off of that. So you can put in a photo of a lion and you want to be told that this is a lion and not a sheep. You can maybe, um, take a photo of a person and want it to say, is this person male or female? You can maybe take a transaction and say, is this transaction fraudulent or not? So those are all examples of classification. And it's a very common problem and it's you know very useful to have solutions to it. Another thing is regression. And regression is when we don't want to just classify in a bunch of categories, but we actually want to get, predict an output. So like with a housing prices example, you might want to put in a bunch of details about a house, you know, maybe it's, its size, its area, um, the crime rate of the, of the area it's in, that kind of thing. And then you want it to predict maybe a value, a thousand rand, a hundred thousand rand, 200,000 rand. Um, so they're, you know, limitless things that could predict, but you want it to predict a value that's quite close to what it actually is. That's a regression problem. We have clustering. And clustering is actually a very simple machine learning kind of solution where we just want to group things. So we just want to, find a kind of some, some grouping that will maximize the distance between groups and minimize the distance within groups. So for example, if we had a bunch of hand-drawn digits, we want to maybe cluster them so that all the sevens are grouped together and all the twos are grouped together. Then we have recommendation systems. And that's often when we want to um, determine, yeah, we, we, we want to um, kind of maybe take an in input and say, what is the most likely response? Or we want to look at somebody's maybe search history and say, what's the most likely thing that they're looking for? Or they watch history and say, what is the most likely um, show that we can recommend? Them? So taking the input and giving almost the response that, that's best suited to that input. Um, and then there's also sequence prediction. And sequence prediction and recommendation are very similar. Because you know, sequence prediction might take in the first few letters of something of, of the letter you're writing, and just like with Gmail, it might then um, you know fill in the blanks for you and say maybe this is a suggested kind of response or a suggested kind of ending off to your email. And then finally, we have what we call generation or style transfer, 
And this is often when you've kind of trained a model on one set of things, and then you um, can kind of apply what you've learned there to another thing. So you can maybe train a model of a, a type of art and then apply it to another image, or you can convert a, a male voice to a female voice, to a Japanese male voice. Um, so it's the ability to, to transfer these, this kind of learning, but also it's the ability to generate completely new things. So if I put in a bunch of faces into an algorithm, I can then use it to actually generate new faces, faces of people that don't even exist, but that look exactly like faces. So that's one of the kind of strengths of generation. Um, in fact, I know that in a lot of video games nowadays, they're doing that where you can actually generate characters in the game um, just based off of, of what you've learned learned about kind of all the features of other characters is quite cool. Um, so again, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a problem and I want you to tell me what type of machine learning technique would solve it. Um, so, so the problem is recommending what somebody will purchase based on their previous purchases. What type of technique would be the best for trying to solve this? Okay, somebody said sequence prediction. So now it's a bit harder between rules-based and, and ML because you can't just get a 50-50 guess. Okay, somebody said clustering. Come on, you guys were all very chatty in the last section. I'd like to see more. Okay, I see sequence prediction again here. I don't want to spend too much time on each of these, so you guys got to be quick with your guesses. Um, yeah, so the solution here is sequence prediction. And it's very much, you know, looking at, at what's come before it and, and, and recommending, it's like a recommender system. So it's looking at what came before it and saying, based on all of these things that they've watched or that they've purchased, what's the most likely thing that they're going to purchase next? So yes, it's a sequence prediction problem. However, you can maybe organize people in different groups based on their purchase history, and that would be clustering. The next problem, is labeling email spam or not spam? So taking in you know, the content of an email and saying, is this a spam email or not? What type of problem do you think it would be? Okay, we've got some people saying classification. More people, more people. Nice, okay. So everyone said classification and that's right here because yeah, we're not, we're not trying to output a number that could exist on you know, a whole range or anything. We're trying to basically say, is this this or this? And classification doesn't have to be two things. It can be many types. But in this case, it's either spam or it's not spam. And a classification algorithm will suit you there. The next problem is, how would we maybe identify trends amongst a group of people who have bought a new music release? So maybe how would we put people in different groups based on um, yeah, the, the, the kind of music that they've been buying. Okay, nice. So everybody's saying clustering, and this is exactly what Ryan was talking about earlier and what I mentioned. We would very easily be able to, to, to find groups in all these kind of, you know, we'd look at the characteristics of all these people that bought the music, and we'd be able to kind of group them based on those trends. Um, so that's, that's clustering, it's, and it's actually a very simple solution, like I said. Um, and now captioning a video. And this is actually quite a complex task. So um, yeah, let, let me know what you think the, the answer is here. Okay, cool. So I've seen three people say generation. Any other kind of options that anyone has? Okay, cool. So it is in fact a generation. And this is because what you need to do is you need to, you know, take in this 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 maybe a video and take in all the frames and be able to get a textual um, description of what's going on. So classify all the things happening and see how those things change over time and then generate captions from that. Um, and generation is the solution there. Because if you think about it, none of the other things we've mentioned would be able to kind of be targeted here. And this is the last one, um, I think. Actually, no, this one's pretty, pretty boring. We'll move on to the next one. Sorry. <laughs> Predicting the strength of a password. Um, that's something that I, I think we can, we can look at. What do you say for predicting the strength of a password?
Okay, so we've got someone saying sequence predictions and or generation, that makes sense. Clustering, okay. Cool, so the solution for this one is actually um, regression, but I think it could also be classification. And the reason is that, you know, you might want to maybe rank the, the, the strength of the password on a score out of 100, and then maybe you can get 89 or 90 for that. Um, but you also might just want to classify it as weak, average, strong. Um, so that's, that's kind of the solution here. And then if you're confused about any of these and want to ask maybe why wasn't it clustering, why wasn't it sequence prediction, we can talk about that. But um, I think in this case, basically, you'd want to learn what the characteristics of a strong password are, and then based on that, predict whether it's strong or weak, or maybe give an actual score value. So it's kind of more suited towards a, a problem where we'd get an output that's either a numerical classification or an actual kind of group category classification. Yeah, so I have lots more examples, but I'm not going to spend all this time going through them. Um, but yeah, so that is essentially, um, you know, the, the different techniques we have and just some, some problems that we um, can kind of see, that we see occurring quite a lot in the real world and then wanting to, um, you know, to, to find the best technique to. So Fortunate joined a bit late and, and said that, you know, asked whether the thing will be uploaded. We will actually upload it. It's, the whole thing has been recorded and will be on our Buddha site soon. Um, yeah. So I've talked a bit about, you know, all the techniques we have, but let's actually look at the process and I'll use an example to explain it to you. But the machine learning process in the real world is often you have some client or some user that has a problem that you're trying to solve. You want to clearly define the objective um, and that means think of the kind of best technique you can use to solve that objective. Then you want to get all the data you need, train and test your model and use that to actually make those predictions. And I'll give you an example to illustrate this process. Imagine our client is a bank and the bank comes to us and says that we have this problem where, you know, we have new clients and they might stay with us for a few years or a few months, but then they stop, they move to another bank or they stop banking altogether. Um, and this is obviously a big problem for these businesses. It's called customer churn because obviously a bank has clients and if they don't have, you know, they lose clients, they're losing revenue. Um, and, and the banking ecosystem relies on lots and lots of clients. Um, yeah, so they say to you, we want to be able to predict who's at risk of leaving so that we can maybe send them targeted email campaigns or offer them specials so that they're less likely to leave. So they don't want to send these, these, these emails to every single client because some people might get annoyed and then just leave the bank. They want to identify who is most likely to be at risk. And they say to you maybe, um, we don't care if you maybe incorrectly classify some safe customers at risk, but we want almost all of the people at risk to be classified as at risk so that we can then target them appropriately. Um, so I think, you know, let me ask you guys here, what, what, what um, technique do you think would be the best thing here? Okay, Craig said sequence prediction. Anyone else have any suggestions? Okay, we've got a regression here. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna look at those and, and work with those. But um, so let me just start by saying maybe why sequence prediction wouldn't work here. Um, so the sequence prediction is when you maybe have a kind of a history and you want to predict predict the next um, the next kind of the next part of that sequence. So person watched this movie, then they watch this movie, now let's predict the next movie they're going to watch. That's often sequence prediction. In this case, you know, customers don't stay, stay, stay at a bank and then leave, or they don't stay, leave, stay, leave. It's not like a kind of trend, a, a sequence of which one appears the next step of. Um, all you have is maybe a bunch of de details about the user. So you might get like their age, their name, um, the size of the account, how long they've been with the bank. And based on that, you just want to classify it. Are they going to leave or are they going to stay? Are they at risk or not? Um, so that would kind of lead us towards thinking this is a classification problem. There we go, right. Um, now, I suppose it could be a regression problem as well, because you might be wanting to output like a risk score. So 
maybe you want to get them on a scale of zero to 100 and say everybody that's more than 50 on this scale will plug it. Um, so regression could work here. Um, and often classification and regression do work together, but there are also problems where um, re regression wouldn't work where classification would. So I think here, yeah, both regression and classification do work, but seeing as though the band courageous one is the final answer of, is this person at risk or not? Classification would do. So then we'll go about collecting all the data. So we get lots and lots of data, maybe from a few million transactions that they've had in the past. And we can build up that data or tell us the details of the person and then did that person leave or not at the end. And based on that, we can then train our model, test it on some unseen data. And if we end up with a score that we like, like if it's 99% accurate at predicting whether somebody's going to leave or not, then that's a good model. Then we hand it over to the client, then they can, in the future, our new people predict, is this person going to leave or not? And in the real world, we do models where the accuracy is 99.9%. .9%. Machine learning's gotten to the stage now where we can predict with almost certain accuracy whether somebody might leave or not. And this all depends on, like I said, the amount of data you have, the strength of your algorithm, all those kind of factors. So that's the process at large. But there are some limitations to the process, and um, I'm going to show you guys a quick video on one of the biggest limitations, which is bias. Let's play a game. Close your eyes and picture a shoe. Okay, did anyone picture this? This? How about this? We may not even know why, but each of us is biased toward one shoe over the others. Now imagine that you're trying to teach a computer to recognize a shoe. You may end up exposing it to your own bias. That's how bias happens in machine learning. But first, what is machine learning? Well, it's used in a lot of technology we use today. Machine learning helps us get from place to place, gives us suggestions, translates stuff, even understands what you say to it. How does it work? With traditional programming, people hand code the solution to a problem, step by step. With machine learning, computers learn the solution by finding patterns in data. So it's easy to think there's no human bias in that. But just because something is based on data, doesn't automatically make it neutral. Even with good intentions, it's impossible to separate ourselves from our own human biases. So our human biases become part of the technology we create in many different ways. There's interaction bias, like this recent game, where people were asked to draw shoes for the computer. Most people drew ones like this. So as more people interacted with the game, the computer didn't even recognize the bias. For example, if you were training a computer on what a physicist looks like, and you're using pictures of past physicists, your algorithm will end up with a latent bias, skewing towards men. And selection bias. Say you're training a model to recognize faces. When you grab images from the internet, photo library, be sure to select photos that represent everyone. Since some of our most advanced products use machine learning, We've been working to prevent that technology from perpetuating technology from perpetuating negative human bias. From merely misleading information from appearing at the top of your search results page, to adding a feedback tool on the search bar so people can flag hateful or inappropriate autocomplete suggestions. It's a complex issue and there's no magic bullet, but it starts with all of us being aware of it so we can all be part of the conversation. Cool. So that video also, I think, did a good job of summarizing um, kind of a lot of the things that I've talked about machine learning today, some of the different techniques for it and why it's different to just kind of rules-based and manually programming everything. Um, before I move on, I'm just going to answer a question. So a question from Craig based on actions such as the number of times they're called customer care. That's actually a very good, um, very good suggestion. So we can incorporate some factors like that into our classification. So we can, for example, um, maybe say, say that the, the factors that most, that most kind of indicate whether somebody's going to leave or not is their, their gender, their age, the bank balance, and how many times they've, say, called customer care or unsuccessfully resolved. So I think that that's something that, that we can definitely incorporate into our prediction, and maybe that could end up being the most important factor. But it's, um, it's not like a sequence prediction in that regard. It would still be a classification problem. And that's definitely one of the factors that we could add into it. 
So that was a really good point. Um, and I want you guys to think about maybe some of the different forms of bias that come into our banking problem. Perhaps we've chosen, so one bias could be actually not having enough factors in. So maybe thinking it's not important whether they've called customer care or not. And if you did that, then maybe your algorithm end up, ends up being really bad. Um, whereas if you were to incorporate customer care as one of the factors, then it would be pretty good. So you need to really think about, um, so there's, there's a degree of Cool. Um, so I seem to have been kicked again, but that's fine. Um, I hope you guys' break is going well. If you ask any questions, do you mind just re-asking them and then I will take some time to answer them before we resume at two o'clock. Any questions from the audience? Shame this guy Isaac keeps him kind of being re added, but that's you know, whatever. So, yeah, any questions from anybody? What I'm just I'm going to do in the meantime is my usual marketing stint. I'm going to um, copy and paste all of our social media things into the chat. And if you want to browse kind of our Instagram page or whatever, you can take a look at that. Would anybody like to cut the break short and then just get straight back into it? Or do we do another five minutes?
Carlson's cool. But I guess I'm going to have to get uh, 12 out of 12 people saying cool, otherwise I can't do that. <laughs> what I can do then is maybe I can just kind of review some things. So um, maybe we can look at some of the other, the other questions I had that I didn't get to ask him. So yeah, um, like translating between two languages. The problem that we'd want to use here is also an idea of generation. Um, because essentially you want to encode the, the kind of details of, of the one input and then generate an, an output that comes from another language. So often kind of these encoding decoding algorithms are these generation ones. Um, and there's a type of machine learning called variation, variational autoencoder, which is very useful for that. So you could, like a sort of phases, you could basically encode what a human face looks like, and then you could decode and get a brand new face. Um, and a lot of those apps we use where we, you know, like face app where we can take our face and see what we look like if we were made female or if we were made older or younger. Those things are generation solutions and they often use these kind of variational autoencoders. It's very cool. But obviously lots of bias can come into that because if you're trying to maybe be able to generate a human face, but you're only training it off of, um, you know, like if you want to do like face app and want to make somebody look older, but you've only ever used, let's say, white people as your, um, as kind of your input, then all of a sudden a black person would try and use, you know, this, this face app, it just wouldn't know how to make them look older because it hasn't been trained on that. So we have to make sure that whatever problem we're looking at, we need to think of all the types of inputs we could get in the future and make sure we train it off that. It's kind of like training an algorithm for cats and dogs, but then, um, you know, you're only ever using, um, you know, ginger cats or you're only ever using small dogs. You never use kind of like the larger dogs like Great Danes and stuff. You need to kind of get the whole range so that you can learn. All right, three more minutes and then we will resume. Um, and again, if you have any questions, this is kind of that, that last chance before we get into the next section. So some other kind of problems we could have had is maybe estimating arrival time based on, on time of day in traffic. And again, that's regression because we're trying to get a numerical output, right? We want to get, um, you know, 4 p.m., 4.13 p.m., 4.13 p.m. in five seconds, those kind of things. When there are just too many options, we don't use classification anymore because classification is when we're limited, maybe we want to classify between 10 types of clothing or between 100 types of fish. but if you want to classify, you know, how many, predict how many eggs this fish is going to you know, lay, then, you know, because the fish can lay thousands of eggs, we want a kind of more regression type solution to that. Cool. So Ryan, in the second half, we're going to look at neural networks. Um, so I'm going to go into a, a bit of, you know, just the layout of neural networks, and, you know, how the things actually learn off these networks. We're going to look at the neurons in these networks and see, you know, how do they on an individual level operate? And then how does that all add up to these really cool algorithms being learned? Um, and then I'm going to show a nice example. And then we will talk about it next time. The next workshop is actually going to be a more technical one where we would, um, yeah, we're actually going to build a, an image recognizing model like the ones you've seen. But we're not going to do cats and dogs because that's boring. We'll do clothing items. So, you know, give the thing a picture of a shoe. You can even take a photo of your shoe, put that in, and then it'll classify it as a shoe and not a pair of pants. And that'll be a really hands on thing next time. So how would you predict the strength of something affected by many parameters is what Fortune is asking. So a strength of a tire being affected by temperature, pressure, driver speed, that's just with a neural network like we've been talking about. That would probably be, I mean, it depends. So if strength of a tire is weak, middle, or strong, then it would be a classification solution. And if it's, you know, on a scale of maybe 1 to 10 or 1 to 100 or 1 to 1,000, that's regression. Um, and you can have many factors. The thing about these, these neural networks is we can have as many inputs as we want. 
So it doesn't just have to be trying to predict one thing off of one thing. It can be a thousand inputs just to predict one thing. So with our, our bank situation, we could have given 10 or 50 details about a customer. Um, it could have been their age, the type of shoes they wear, um, the town that they're from, their occupation, all those kind of factors. And all of that could have gone into predicting um, you know, whether they're going to leave or not. So that's just the strength of, of machine learning. You can put in lots and lots and lots of factors and make predictions based off of that. Cool. So we're going to move on now to the next section, which is neural networks. Um, and this is what a neural network looks like. It looks, okay, let it load. <laughs> um, we'll give it a, a second or two to get there. But um, you can see the kind of weird architecture on the, on the bottom there. There we go. So this is what a neural network is. And a neural network is the classic machine learning architecture for a lot of the problems that we've been we've been looking at. And these neural networks are modified for different problems. So for regression, you often use what's called an artificial neural network, which is almost like the most basic form. For classification, you do what's called a convolutional neural network. For maybe sequence prediction, you often do things called recurrent neural networks and so on and so on. Um, and I, I can maybe at the end or next time talk about those different types. But right now, we're just going to look at the standard neural network and work off of there. So how neural networks work is we have this input layer. Um, I'm going to put my mouse there. I hope you can all see it. Um, maybe I'll actually go into present now. It'll make it easier because I can use the cursor. Um, so let's just give us a few seconds to load the present. So you have all of these inputs. Um, and these inputs, just like we talked about with the car tires, are those factors. So input one could maybe be the, the size of the tire. Input two could be the type of the tire. Input three could be the color of the tire, whatever. Um, and we pass it through all these kind of things called layers, which is all this kind of like mathematical machinery that we'll talk about. And at the end, you get your outputs. And in the case of, um, of the car tire, it would just be one output, which would be maybe a score of how strong it is. Um, but you can have many outputs as well. Often when you are trying to classify maybe like the type of animal, it can have many outputs and what it's going to predict is a probability. So it might say like here, lion, 99%, here, um, you know, turtle, 0.05%, here, um, hare, 0.05% or something like that. Um, yeah, so, um, oh yeah, yeah, anyway. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so we can have many different types of outputs um, and we can have many types of inputs. And all the stuff in the middle are these layers. Um, and how it typically works is you have your input, which could be a factor such as the age of the person. And that input is going to go to all the kind of what we call nodes in that hidden layer, um, as well as all the other inputs applying what's called a weight. So you see this thing here, this W. That input is going to be times by some value and go there. It's going to be times by some other value and go there times by some other value and go there and so on for all of those and then because you see this node is getting inputs from all of the inputs before it's going to take all of those weighted values sum them up together and apply some form of function and we'll talk more about those functions later but those are called activation functions and then at this layer you see now we have all of these kind of outputs from the last layer but these become the inputs to the next layer so now whatever we got here a weight's going to be applied to it and it's going to go there a way it's going to be applied to it's going to go there and then a way it's going to be applied to this and it's going to go there and again we're going to take the weighted sum we're going to apply some function and so on and you can do that hundreds of times if you want and eventually that's going to be up there which is going to give you that you want whether it's a probability whether it's a regression value um, and it kind of seems like a bit of magic like you just pass it through all these things and then we get this output but i'm going to tell you kind of why that that happens um, so here's an example for our cat dog problem of what's basically happening. You have an input, which is an image of either a cat or a dog. It's going to pass it through all these layers we've spoken about. And then at the end, all you get is a simple, it's a cat or it's a dog. Um, what's happening is you take an image often and a, an image can be seen as, you know, rows and columns of pixel values. And those can be read in just like a number, just like the you know, age of the banking client or the, um, the amount of money they have in their account. It can be read just like a number and passed in through all these layers until we get to this output. So that's the broad, broad, broad idea of what's going on here. But I want to ask you um, if that makes sense. So do you have any questions based on what I've just said? OK. 
can can if, if it's difficult to conceptualize and you'd like me to re-explain you can maybe just type in re-explain otherwise maybe just say cool and i'll continue okay to so work on something to re-explain and how do you decide in the waiting cool so that's a really important um question and this idea of our layers filtering as well, no data is lost. Those, okay, so there are three things I want to tackle here. First is just the re-explanation, and I'll look here. So like we said with these kind of neural networks, you are getting an input and you want to get an output, whether the output is a prediction of a value, whether it's a classification, whether it's the next step in a sequence. So we've, we've talked about how we have inputs and outputs in, in, in machine learning. Um, all these things that happen in between are ways for us to basically interpret the inputs, um, find the features of the input that are important, and get an output. Um, so that's the, the simplest explanation of, of maybe all these layers. So the one question, um, let me just rev revise it, was how we decide in the weighting. So actually, at first, all the weights are randomized. So you'll get you know, your, 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 maybe your age of the client, and you'll just times it by five, or times it by four, or times it by 4.5. Um, all of the weights, even though there are thousands of weights in the network, will be randomized at first, um, and then you're going to get some output. And how the thing learns, which we'll get to later, is it finds out how wrong it's been, and then changes the weights accordingly, so that the next time it's a bit better. So what you're changing to make the thing learn over time is not the in input or the output, but you're changing the weights. That's the only thing that you can change in this network. Um, so at first it's just random, and then you just decide the weighting is kind of decided by the algorithm later on. Regarding the question of how the layers might maybe filter, you do have to do some filtering. So what we'll talk about with, with images is you don't want to pass in all the kind of pixels, right, of this cat or this dog. That's a lot of data to deal with. You want to maybe identify features or, or, or segments. Often what they do is they pass it through a filter that maybe takes little mini squares and those become the inputs. Instead of taking the whole thing, or you might only take, you know, you might take the many squares and then average the values in those squares to get an idea of what's happening in the region. So that is the filtering you're doing. First of all, it makes the thing simpler, but second, instead of being a super granular and trying to find a million features, it can look for a few dozen features in a photo instead. So yes, um, you do do a degree of filtering and data is lost, but you're trying to pick up patterns. You're not trying to learn exactly from the data, because if you learned exactly from the data, you would never be able to predict. Whereas if you find patterns, you can. Cool. So I talked about these layers and these nodes. So let's look at it a bit more carefully. So how at an individual level, you know, I mentioned that we have input layers and we have hidden layers. Um, you're going to take your input and it's going to go to this layer and it's going to pass through a mathematical function, which is called an activation function, right? And that activation function can be often seen as a yes or no in very simple cases. So you get an input and then it checks, is this input maybe greater than value? Yes, activate that neuron. No, do not activate the neuron. And maybe here it's important for me to kind of link this to the brain, right? So how our brains work is we have all these neurons. This is why we call them neurons and artificial neural networks. We have these neurons in our brain and they get signals. And often, based on the signal, they'll either turn on or off. And then if they've turned off, nothing happens. And if they've turned on, they pass that signal further, and so on and so forth. And at an individual level, that seems really simple. But when you have billions and billions of neurons working in the brain with these yes and no signals, it ends up you know, creating these really complex behaviors. And that's led to intelligence and art and all the things we love and, and enjoy. All that's come from just these complex interactions of billions of very simple neurons. Um, and that's what's happening here. So in this network, at each layer, you're getting the inputs and they're being passed through these functions. And it's the combination of the yeses and the noes that's essentially leading to that output and that complex, really clever behavior. Um, so here's an example that will make it a bit easier. If our input was a five and the activation function was less than 10, Yes, we're going to activate the neuron. No, we're not going to activate the neuron. Another example is maybe the input is the letter seven. It can ask the question, has a curve? Um, yes, activate the neuron. No, do not activate the neuron. And because seven doesn't have a curve, it's going to be no. Now, obviously, we can't you know, code it up 
to say, does the thing have a curve? But we would maybe find a mathematical expression that can verify whether this has a curve or not. Same with number six. So six we say does have a curve. So it's going to activate the neuron. And it's this combination of activated and deactivated neurons that leads to our outputs. So if we go back to the cat and dog example, um, maybe one neuron is going to ask somebody, um, does the thing have floppy ears? And for a dog, it would say yes, but for a cat, it would say no. Then basically, it's going to pass through this network with that, and that one yes is going to feed into our answer. So the fact that it had floppy ears is going to make us more likely to think it's a dog because it was a yes than a cat. And it doesn't always have to be yes or no. Sometimes it can be, um, sometimes it can be, you know, like a probability. So what's the probability that this thing has a floppy ear? You might say 0 0.9 for the dog and 0 0.1 for the cat. And then that, um, and I know this might sound a bit kind of complex right now, but we're actually going to go to the TensorFlow playground and that's going to really give us a better idea of how these things like work together um, to, to do really cool stuff. But before I do that, as usual, are there any other questions here? I'll give you guys 30 seconds to maybe type up any questions you have. But I think an important thing, to, and I'll go back to the cats and dogs here to remember, is that a dog and a cat have similar features and different features. And we train the algorithm by um, basically saying, how many of the features of a dog does this input that we have have versus how many features of a cat? Which one is it more likely to be? So maybe dogs are characterized by floppy ears, um, quite being quite big and having bigger faces, and cats are characterized by whiskers and longer tails and being smaller. So you'll have all these neurons that are asking these questions. Does it have whiskers? Does it have floppy ears? And all of those yeses and nos will lead it to either being a cat or a dog. So a dog will be something that has maybe all of the features of a dog, yes, and maybe one or none of the features of a cat is yes. Um, and then you'd say it's a dog. And for a cat, it would be the opposite. And sometimes you can get things in the middle. And that's why we often work with probabilities instead. So we can find, instead of just yes or no, this is a cat or dog, we can say, what's it more likely to be? And then we choose based on that. Cool. So I'm just checking um, the questions. Okay, Tabo got an online test now. Sorry, man. Good luck. I'm glad you enjoyed the session. You're going to miss out on some cool things with the TensorFlow playground. Okay, cool. So on my screen here, we have the TensorFlow Playground. And this is something quite nice to go in and kind of tinker with um, in your own time, because it displays a lot of the kind of cool concepts we're looking at. Um, so what's essentially happening here is we want to, we've got this data, um, and you can see it's kind of like all these blue dots in the center and all the orange dots around. And we want to train an algorithm that's going to actually learn that pattern, right? Um, and these features are the inputs. So we're saying, can we learn that pattern just with this feature and this feature, where this feature is vertical, this feature is vertical lines and this feature is horizontal lines. And maybe we start just with horizontal lines. So we want that as the input, and then we've got some you know, hidden layers like I've told you about. And we want to train it over time and see if it can find that pattern. So we're going to press, press play. And what an epoch is, is an epoch is just like a, um, a run through of the learning algorithm. So it can go quite fast here and it's running and it's running and it's done like 78, it's done 90. And what you can see in the right here is that this is the best you can learn of this pattern just with vertical lines. You can see that here it's got a vertical line that's kind of separated all the oranges and here another one. But here in the middle, it can't really do that because with vertical lines only, you can't separate these um, orange ones on top of the, the blue ones. But this is the best thing it can do. And over here, we see the improvement of it over time. So in the beginning, it was getting better every time, and now it's kind of just flatlined. So that's, that's one run of it. But now what I want to do is run it maybe with horizontal lines as well. So now we're trying to find a combination of horizontal and vertical lines that will click play again. And you can see it learn. It, it starts off pretty bad, and very quickly, it's actually found the pattern perfectly. It's been able to perfectly separate the orange and the blue just with the combination of vertical and horizontal lines. How cool is that? 
But now, why don't we try and learn a spiral? Can we learn a spiral pattern here with horizontal and vertical lines? Let's press play and find out. So it's going to take some time. And as you can see, um, by looking at kind of the improvement over time, it's just not really making much progress. Like it's very difficult with horizontal and vertical lines to learn that very complex pattern. In fact, it's, it's just not learning at all. And maybe after waiting a, a, an eternity, something might happen, but you know, we don't have patience for that. So we're going to stop it. And we're going to see what happens if we added a bunch of other features. So we added these features, these features, this feature, and this feature. And why don't we just to illustrate the point to make it a more complex thing. So I'm just going to add a lot more layers to this thing. Move it to OCD, so it's going to be a six, five, five, four, three, two, one kind of thing. And let's see now, like with this kind of complex architecture and all these features, will we be able to learn the spiral? And let's watch it over time and see what happens. And see already, it's contorting in a way that starts to kind of mimic that pattern. It's trying to find regions of only orange and regions of only blue by combining all these features we've talked about. And watch all these things happening. Like it's it's trying its best. And if you look at the top right, over time, it's it's that kind of graph is going down, which, which implies it's getting better. And there's a bit of oscillation because trying different things. And we can see it's still getting better and better and better. So we're just going to watch it, see what happens. But as you can see, right? Right, we've got this distinct region where it's only oranges and this distinct region where it's only blues. And it's actually learning that spiral pattern, right? And I'll stop there because I think it's almost where once we want it to be. Just by adding kind of a more complicated architecture and adding all these features, we've learned the spiral pattern. And if we wanted to, we could even apply this, this, this architecture to the first problem and see that immediately, very quickly, Give it a sec. Very quickly, it learns that same pattern that we did before, right? So the solution to the spiral thing is also the solution to this one. However, as we've seen, it's unnecessary to do that because we could have done that just with horizontal and vertical lines. So depending on the problem you have, you're going to have to have different input features that you look for, and you're going to have to have a different type of architecture. Um, and there's a question which is, how would you know what parameters are important? And the way you judge what parameters are important, well, you have to start off with your with your, your suspicions, right? So you want to, um, we thought that with horizontal and vertical lines, we could get this thing and we could, but when we try to apply it to the spiral problem, we realized we were missing things out. So we didn't have enough kind of inputs that would be able to over time explain that pattern. So a lot of machine learning does come from trial and error, um, but yeah, you, you need to have a kind of idea of what, what things are good predictors. So you know, with trying to predict the strength of a car tire, you're not going to um, use, you know, the size of my shoe as a factor for that, but you're going to use the color of the tire, maybe, or the type of material of the tire as a factor. So you can kind of um, find out what, what factors are more important than others. Um, and if you are asking me maybe how we know what, what weights are important and like what factors are the most important of the ones that we've chosen, if they're all good, well, that's what gets me to the next section. But before that, I just want to talk a bit more about activation functions. So, um, so I, yeah, we did the, the playground, and that, that was a good idea of showing us kind of how this thing works in practice. And here's, here's an activation function. So we said that on a neuron level, we get an input, we apply a function to it, and that becomes an output. And two common ones in practice are the sigmoid and the rectified linear unit one. Now, what a sigmoid does is it gives us a value between 0 and 1. And that's very useful for probabilities. Because if we wanted to feed in a photo of a dog and we wanted to know if it has floppy ears or not, we don't want it to just be floppy or not floppy because a cat might have floppy ears, right? So then that will kind of ears that are kind of floppy and we don't want that to say yes. So we'd rather get a, a probability value like 0, 0.5 or 0, 0.6. It just allows us to have a far more nuanced kind of algorithm that, that's being built out. Rather than just yes or no, we can get maybe. Um, a rectified linear unit is like, 
if the value we get from the weighted sum is, is positive, then we want to keep it. But if it's less than zero, we just want it to be zero. So that's very much like a turn on or turn off kind of situation like we saw um, earlier, where if it's yes, activate. If it's no, do not activate. Whereas with sigmoid, it's like, don't just say yes or no, but give us a value that will then feed onwards. Um, and now I think there's a very important question, which is how does learning actually occur in what we're doing? Um, and it's quite mathematical and complicated, so I'm going to try and do the, the simplest possible answer. But how learning occurs is through this method called backpropagation, and that all starts with our error. So if we were trying to predict housing prices, and the house's actual price is 100,000 Rand, and our, the first time we run our algorithm, it gives 150,000 Rand, clearly there's an error, right? And we want to improve our model so the next time it doesn't predict 150,000, but maybe it predicts 125,000, which is closer to the truth. So we always start with the error, and then we find out which factors and which weights contributed the most to that error. And we do that through a method called backpropagation. Um, and how backpropagation works is we find out what changes to our weights would lead to the error being a bit better in the direction we want it to be. So in the very simple case, we've got this U curve over here. And with our initial weight, we got an error that was quite high, right? And we can find out through differentiation and backpropagation, that well, we can find out through differentiation that if we maybe decrease that weight value, we'd get closer towards the actual minimum error value. Um, now, that's just for one weight. For many weights, you're not kind of having this little curve. You're going to have maybe like a multi-dimensional surface, but the same applies. Essentially, you can find out what position you're on in that surface, and you can find out what direction you need to go in to maybe make it better the next time around. So you often work out the gradient. You find out the gradient of your loss function with respect to all of these weights, and you can find out which weights contribute the most towards your loss and what direction change they need to have. So maybe some weights need to be increased, in some ways, it needs to be decreased, and that'll put you in a better direction. Um, yeah, so you want to always move in the best direction, and you also want to take a, a step of a certain size. Because if I'm at the point now, the red point on this on this plot, and I take too big a step, then I could end up on the other kind of curve. Whereas if I take a small step, um, then I'm getting closer, but I haven't jumped over it. But you also don't want to take too small a step, because if you take a really small step, it could take long firstly, but secondly, Imagine there was like a little bump, right? And it got stuck in that bump because it thought that it can't go, go um, you know, any further. Um, you can get trapped in what's called a local minima and you want to get to the global minima. But your step size shouldn't be too big because then you can jump past your global minima, but it shouldn't be too small because then you can get stuck in local minima. So you often need to play around a bit to find maybe the best step size so that you get there in a reasonable amount of time. And that's how learning occurs. You basically say, how wrong will we? What do we need to change to be less wrong next time? And you keep on running that. Just like in that playground, we had those things called epochs. Every single epoch, it's getting a bit closer, a bit closer, a bit closer, until eventually it gets to a point where there's no more, no more um, improvement to be made. So let's show that again here. So I'm going to remove these layers because um, you know they've reached their kind of whatever. And I'm going to go back to the simplest example we had. So in this case, with just the vertical lines, this, this kind of line is that error we've made. And as you can see, the error is decreasing over time, but then quite quickly it gets to a point where it can't improve anymore. So we've reached that minimum. And that's not a good solution. But now we add another thing, we run it again. And again, the error decreases over time until it gets to a point where it can't get any better, but we've also found our solution. So that's why, you want to basically get a combination of, of a good architecture where it's going to um, not only get to a point where it can't improve anymore, but also be the right thing. That's all how learning occurs at the end of the day. Um, and what are the limitations of neural networks? So a massive limitation of neural networks is the availability of data. Um, or you could even think of it in the playground example as the availability of features. When we were only trading off of one feature, vertical lines, we couldn't get a proper solution. But when you change them, um, and in the real world that comes from, you know, just yeah, not having enough data. So if we're trying to, you know, predict whether something's a cat or a dog, we can't train it with one picture of a dog and one picture of a cat. Because then if you ever show it a dog that wasn't that original dog, it's gonna say, no, this is a cat. And if you ever show a cat that's not a not the original cat, it's gonna say this is a dog. 
So you want to give it thousands of pictures of cats and dogs until it can kind of learn what a cat generally looks like and then predict it. So it's hard to often get all the data you need. Um, and that's a massive limitation of the field because when you quite, quite, quite literally only have a few That's computationally intensive. So, you know, the, the neural network playground trains very fast. That's a very simple problem. But if you train lots of images or video at such a high resolution and all those things, cloud where we can use other computers to do these. But again, it, it can be very intensive, and that's why you can't just randomly have a complicated architecture um, and why you can't just throw too much data at it. You need to think, what's the right amount of data? What's the right architecture? And that's how you can um, simplify the problem and make it kind of less intensive. Another limitation is the interpretability. So it's very hard to actually understand what relationships are being kind of concluded here. So if you were, had two factors for why a customer might leave, if one factor was their age and the other factor was their, the area they come from, the neural network won't really tell you which one is more important. Whereas with maybe if you guys have ever done regression before, in that kind of modeling, you can tell exactly what contribution age has to the output. So neural networks are very cool at predicting, but that comes at the expense of not being able to really interpret why that is predicting. So it kind of tells you what, but not why. And the final kind of limitation, and this is a limitation to basically all machine learning Hello, people. Um, Okay, I'm going to need you to tell me what is the last thing you heard me say, because I didn't realize that I'd been timed out. <laughs> Can anybody like remember the last sentence I said or something? Do you mind just typing in the chat? Limitations. Okay, do you, do you mind? But did I go through all the limitations or did I stop it? Did I get through interpretability? Okay, great. Thanks for your patience, everyone. So the final limitation is this idea of no real learning being done. Um, and that's because at the end of the day, even though your, your algorithm can predict a cat or a dog, if you were to ask it, hey, algorithm, please describe what a cat is to me, it wouldn't really be able to tell you. If you were to try and get it to do something else, and I'll like say, okay, now describe, you know, please predict whether these are shoes or handbags, it wouldn't be able to do that. It can only kind of do what it's been trained to do, because there's no real intelligence. You know, these algorithms can't think, they can't feel. And I think maybe now that you've seen what's happening behind the scenes, you understand why a lot of people aren't too afraid about, um, about you know, robots taking over the world so soon. Oh, um, I'll get back to finishing interpretability now. The reason we're not that afraid about robots taking over the world is largely because um, you know they, they actually aren't really learning, at least right now. So we can only train them to do one thing at a time. Um, and that means that we don't really have general AI. We just have algorithms that are really good at doing one task. So it's a limitation, but it's also maybe a good thing for us because we don't have to worry about these things kind of improving while we're sleeping and then taking over the world one day. Um, if you want a better explanation why there's no real learning happening, I can give you one. So back to interpretability, the one thing I was saying was just that 
once we've got this algorithm, it's very good at making predictions, but it doesn't really explain how we got to that conclusion. Because there's so many layers and things involved, and there's so much math going on behind the scenes, we can't really look at that and say, okay, I understand how it's making these associations. So for anybody that's done stats and has done regression, you can, through regression, tell maybe how much age contributed to um, somebody getting cancer. Um, but with a neural network, all you can really do is predict, are they going to get cancer? But you can't say which factors are more likely to make them go to get, get cancer. So neural networks are far more powerful, but at the expense of this interpretability being lost. Nice. Um, so yeah, now that I've talked about the limitations, let's just review neural networks. So I hopefully have to explain to you what a neural network is, um, when it's useful. And the answer to that is for all these kind of solutions we've been talking about, um, all these techniques, they're all some variant of a neural network. And then what it can do that a simpler model might not be able to do, it's like what I just said, it's very accurate. So regression, which is a very simple model, can maybe with some accuracy predict, you know, somebody's going to get cancer, but a neural network can maybe predict with very high, high, like 90% accuracy. And then finally, the limitations of neural networks and machine learning in general, it's those issues of data availability, interpretability, the fact that they don't really learn, bias, all those things. Um, so before I wrap things up, I just want to get you guys to tell me, are there any kind of major questions you have? If I were to explain one or two things again that we've covered today, what would you like me to re-explain? Don't be afraid to ask things. We've got you know, plenty of time to, to work through any, any kinks. You can also unmute yourself and ask them if you feel more comfortable if it's a longer question. Um, I'm very open to that. And alternatively, if you have no questions, you can just say maybe cool in the chat. Yeah, so fortunate. that's a really good question, asking about, should we start with data analysis first, including regression? Yeah, so uh, maybe not regression, but, but often before you do any type of modeling, you want to do exploratory data analysis. So you want to already find out some of the associations. So in that banking example, um, we can already kind of see, just from doing some scatter plots, we can see, like, um, what's the relationship between people, age and people leaving? Um, or if we're trying to predict um, somebody's maybe like their credit worthiness on a scale of zero to 100, and one of the factors is their age from zero to 100, you can try and see if there's any pattern already in age and credit worthiness. And you can do that with all your factors. You can try and find those associations. That'll give you a better idea for interpretability. We can even do some regression, but the idea is that um, regression will basically be like a less accurate version of the machine learning. And regression, you're not going to want to use all the data, and you can't like do regression, for example, with images. Um, so, an artificial neural network is like regression on steroids. Um, but then, when you're doing images, you won't even look at that. You'll do like a convolutional neural network, which I'll talk about next time. Um, but yeah, it's always good to first kind of understand the patterns because that'll help you with interpretability. And then you use the neural network to be your final say in the matter to basically do your predictions. So you want to kind of have a combination of data analysis and the neural networks that you can predict, but also then explain maybe why, um, what things led to that prediction. Um, so yeah, that was a really good question. Thank you. Are there any other questions? All righty. So yeah, um, that is wrapping up this, this workshop. And the goal next time will actually be to create a neural network model to classify images of clothing, like sneakers and shirts. So by the end of it, you'll be able to upload a picture of one of your t-shirts and it'll say, this is a shirt. 
um, and a picture, you know, of one of your shoes, and I'll say this is a shoe. And you know, I can maybe show you some little hints. You know, we're going to be getting more quite deep into it. So we're going to actually be using the libraries Python, like Keras and TensorFlow. We're going to be, you know, doing all this code here, all the pre-processing, making predictions at the end. Um, yeah, so if you guys are more coding oriented, then this is going to be um, a lot, a lot more enjoyable, and you're actually going to build something at the end of it that you can then improve on yourself and learn from and everything. But guys, thank you. I really enjoyed your, you know, attendance and your involvement and in the answering of the questions and also the asking of questions. And I hope you also enjoyed yourself. So before you leave, um, I'm just going to post a link to a feedback form. I guys, one of those drops where I got disconnected. Um, that those shouldn't have happened but thank you for your patience um please 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 fill in the form at some stage just you know it'd be really helpful to all of us if we found out what things could be better next time because we don't want part two of this workshop to you know be a failure if part one of the workshop was a failure so um yeah your feedback is very helpful fortunately you've asked what we're going to use next time we are going to use python um you can do machine learning in different languages like c plus plus and r um but python is the i think the most supported one at the moment and a lot of the really cool libraries we use, like Keras, work well with Python. Um, so yeah, next time, I think for the next workshop, Python knowledge is, is probably helpful, or just general coding knowledge. Um, and even if you don't, you can just f follow along, um, see the code, copy and paste things, and then I'll do it in a way such that you can you can tinker around with it, even if you can't code. You can just maybe change you know, this value and see how it changes differently. Um, or you can change it to different types of data instead of clothing items to different animals. So I'll make it so that even if you can't code, you can copy and paste all the code and then just change one or two values and then get different really cool results. Um, when part two is gonna happen? So we've got a pretty tight schedule with events happening for the next while. Um, we've got a user and taste workshop happening next week. The next week we've got a LinkedIn workshop with Microsoft. The next week we're gonna have a, um, a WordPress and search engine optimization workshop and all those things. So I think if you want part two to come soon, I'll put that kind of on the priority list. And hopefully that'll happen then in maybe middle of July during the holidays. Um, maybe we can kick off the holidays with a nice part two workshop. Um, I just need to make some final kind of adjustments to, to the resources I have for it. And yeah, then we'll, we'll get along with it. But thanks for asking that. So I'm glad that you're really thinking about the next one. So yeah, um, I'm gonna stay here for another 10 minutes to answer any other questions you have. But if you're ready to leave, then Thank you for attending. Please fill in the feedback form and have a great day and you know, keep working hard, keep on developing. Any other questions?